sense. Probably also in a way that maybe from some corners might not only excite us, but also enlighten us. But also I think that can engage us. So just on that score alone, it's great to have someone like Luke with us. Let's give him a big Creative writing is something that Singapore has not always taken very seriously. In fact, even until very recently, meaning until about two years ago, the sort of like National University of Singapore, which I'm a product, uh, so is Hapa, so are all people around here. Um, until very recently, NUS didn't think it was a worthy enough subject to teach or to even offer causes in. Even the great uh, Edwin Thambu, who's like our national poet, couldn't bring that about. And it only came about under a very special sort of thing where guys like him could offer a course under a wonderful dispensation of the university to big people called special topics. So under special topics, you can have a course creative writing. You know what I mean? Which brings me to a long, long time ago when I was cheeky enough, I'm still cheeky, but I was cheeky enough in 1974 to suggest to NUS, then known as the University of Singapore, to introduce a course in science fiction and fantasy at the university. Of course, the answer is it never got beyond my head or department. <laughs> all right? And those days there were no emails and all that, so we couldn't sort of like write to the big guy and copy and all that. So, but I want to, I want to share with you that at that point, we were not alone, right? Because a friend of mine wanted to do a master's degree in science fiction on the epic science fiction book made into a movie called Solaris. All right, very, very interesting. Stanislaw Lem, Polish writer. The University of Melbourne, to which she applied, turned her down. But because she had used my sort of name, not quite in vain, but as a kind of reference point, which turned out to be in vain anyway, all right, he made another sort of comment. All right? So you have a type letter saying, sorry, thank you for your interest. Uh, we're sorry we don't uh, offer courses in this. No, certainly not at graduate level, nor at the undergraduate level. Then he put a PS. I am most intrigued that this academic, Kerfal Singh, thinks that science fiction is worthy of academic pursuit. Now that comment led to a lot of engagement between me and this professor, <laughs> all right, later on in life. I was then a much younger sort of person, but still fiery. But guess what? In 1975, a very interesting happened in Australia. And that was the establishment of a university which today has become quite well known to Singaporeans, the university called Murdoch, Murdoch University. They were established in 1975. In September of that year, I received an invitation to conduct six lectures for the opening of the English department at Murdoch University. And the theme was science fiction and the apocalyptic imagination. Reason being, I had published a small essay with that title. All right? I still am thinking whether I should bring it out as a book. So maybe this Heaven and Hell series might, you know. But I'm trying, the reason why I'm sharing this narrative with you is to say that sometimes the old and the established are really not the way forward. Right? The way forward might be the new, the young, the creative, and the bold. Alright? Never was a Prime Minister more bold than Lee Kuan Yew when he was 35 years old and Prime Minister of a little country called Singapore. He was very bold to a point where he came to the university, told us off, to all the students off, and said, don't you dare fight with me because you lose. And he said, if you think as a student you're going to get sympathy, sympathy votes, I'll handle that. You know what I mean? That was his very strict talking. I think today we are again in a crisis where many of us have learned to beat around the bush in very, very exciting ways without coming to the point. One of the things, now I must confess to you, Luke, I know I made you a promise that I will read <laughs> revelations of my wonderful little family holiday in Chiang Mai. But you know the, the very delectable distractions yeah. all right, of Chiang Mai and the shenanigans of my wonderful young sort of nine-year-old son give me very little time to finish the book. But I dipped into it. And it's very interesting, I was having a little 
conversation with your mom that you know we better be very careful because if Armageddon comes in 2015, Jesus has you know more or less published right to say it's going to come. There's a fourth installment, right? Fourth installment of his book, of his series. It's going to be quite you know quite a significant. All right. We know that the Mayan or Mayan uh, <laughs> prophecy. All right, boosted and bolstered by the great Nostradamus and all of that, and by Gungnam, you know, all right, the crazy horse and all of that. Um, <laughs> we know that those billion, do, you know, billion hits on, on, on Gangnam and all that did not finally result in the December termination of the world. Two things about that very interesting. One is, whether we like it to admit it or not, a lot of people were secretly a little bit anxious, if not very anxious. Some people were very anxious. They actually went to the main sites and all that. It's kind of spiritual journey, pilgrimage. Others mostly drank, all right, on the eve of that final, you know, December day. Be spiritual. Be spiritual, right? <laughs> okay. And I think the reason for that is everybody thought that if the whole world is going to cease, right, then it doesn't really matter. Because then there's no crying, right? Nobody left to cry because we're all gone, right? Like, you know, it's all finished. But life is never so easy, okay? And different religions promise us very different terminal points, okay? Basically, we can divide the world's religions, and now I'm talking in a very personal capacity, nothing to do with my being here officially at SMU and all of that. So I'm going to make this a sharing session, because as you know, the, the whole series of Heaven and Hell, all right, whether we like it or not, is not even disguised spiritual, but it's openly spiritual. Okay? Um, even the titles, you know, as you go along with Genesis, Apocalypse, Revelations, Armageddon, and all of that. And there are sources of this that are taken very clearly, all right, from a certain big book, uh, which Christians all should know very well, all right? Most of us seem to know the, the later book, the New Testament. Many of us uh, have not even touched or read or understood the Old Testament. But many of us take it upon ourselves to talk about this, sometimes perhaps with not enough insight and depth. I being you know, among them, right? Because even though I have two graduate diplomas in biblical studies, something that I'm making public for the first time in SMU, <laughs> um, as a book, the Old and the New Testament are uh, not only beautiful books in terms of literary value and merit and all of that, but they're good books. All right? Many years ago, I did raise with SMU that one of the things that we should do is to have a course called The Great Books of the World, where we can talk about these things. The green light for that has not been given yet. <laughs> all right? Though I was told, as I'm sure Prof. Tambu was told, that there's always a possibility of offering such a course under special topics. <laughs> okay? Which... Uh, I haven't done it because it's a matter of principle. But the point is that if we divide the world's faiths into two broad categories, one, those are basically kind of Indian-inspired, you know, the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Jain, that sort of group, all right, by and large. We have what we call the religions that are basically centered and anchored on a cyclical view of existence. All right? So, which means that there is no terminal point. Then we have the three great monotheistic religions, all right? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in that order, that are basically what we call teleological. They have got a final point. They've got an end point in view, which means they rest on the basis that one day, this world, as we know it, is going to come to an end. Okay? These, I think, are, are very important issues to talk about and discuss and engage with, whether by way of fiction, whether by way of actual causes. All right? We don't have causes in religion. One of the worries of that has been in SMU, we actually did think and talk and discuss the possibility of offering a cause in comparative religion. The worry has been, one, who's going to teach it? And two, where is this person or persons where are they going to come from? Because they are very sensitive areas. But we took a great deal of comfort when the president of Georgetown University, so a Catholic university, all right, visited Singapore 
and we had a small discussion with him, and he said he felt that as a Catholic university, Georgetown should take the lead among the American universities and establish a chair in Islamic studies, so that at least the Islamic religion would meet with the Catholic faith on a kind of even keel and discuss issues in an open, frank, and democratic kind of way. Now that's one of the best universities in the world for us. All right? We may or may not emulate what Georgetown is doing. I had some discussion with Prof. Tomiko, who, by the way, as a very distinguished Singaporean, sits on the Law Advisory Board of Georgetown University. Quite a distinction for a Singaporean. When and if we ever arrive at that kind of point, it will be very interesting to offer courses in which books like the ones that Luke is writing and helping us broaden our vision may be recommended readings. All right? My challenge to all of us is, have we got the capacity, the maturity, to engage in issues of good and evil? And very unfortunately, in 2012, 2013, we are basically living in what I call a, a time period in which 30% seems to be okay, but 70% basically quite not okay. In fact, quite a lot of what's happening around us is profoundly evil. All right? you know, and it's evil to the point where even those who you know, don't get too carried away by ordinary events are shocked at the capacity of human beings to inflict on each other the kind of cruelty from which even the most vicious of animals shy away. Is that bad? Right? In Singapore, we are finding ourselves caught in all kinds of little things. And we are also caught in you know, what we call the national conversation. The national conversation, unfortunately, is political. And it therefore does not always have the space for us to raise the kinds of issues that I'm raising or we're talking about here. But I really want to urge each and every one of you to pick up the books, read, and engage with the author. Because he's young, he's here, he's dynamic, and he's very open to engagement. That's what I like about Luke. All right? Even though he is basically quite centered in his own faith and spiritual journey, he's not one to like, inflict us with that. At least not immediately. All right? okay? um, you know, he may do so in later life or along the way. Which is fine, because after all, we are inflicted by people who have got nothing good to share with us, but they inflict us. You must know this, Kapal. Must I know it? Yeah, you must. All right, sit with me for 10 minutes and listen to me. A lot of people do that to me, you know, because they want to share their burdens with me, or they want to share their enlightenment with me. But a lot of these sharing, a lot of these sharings, all right, are not cogent, they're not clearly thought out, and they're not presented in a permanent kind of way. So that I can go back to them again and again and again. All right? As an old man of 64, memory sometimes becomes a problem. Apart, I don't know whether your memory is still absolutely intact. Mike I'm is much younger than you are. Fading a little bit away. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very young man. Um, but I think it's good that Luke has actually put that, you know, that sharing into books that we can refer again and again and they are there in a permanent kind of form, or as permanent as it can be, for us to actually be able to reflect and engage with. And these are very dynamic activities. We had a talk today in the afternoon by a person who has served at the, you know, almost at the highest of echelons of the civil service. And one of the things he shared with us was that Singapore is not yet what most people would consider to be a functioning democracy. All right? That is a kind of uh, ideal that we are working towards. But post 2011 elections, we are you know, sort of like going quite fast in that direction of arriving at a functioning democracy. The problem is, are we mature enough to be able to handle that? Are we able to handle truth without hurt and without <coughs> inflicting hurt? in the self-righteous justification that I'm right and you're wrong. Okay? This is very, very significant, I think. It's a significant moment in our lives. And for the young people that we are trying to nurture, this is my appeal to the adults in the room, adults as in children, not students, all right? They're growing up in a world which is 
far more unstable than the world that I grew up in. Okay, for me, a lot of the world was very predictable. Okay, most of the time, I was told what to do. Now we balk at that because the young are not interested in just hearing us telling them. All right, they want more show, meaning show me what you're really doing with your life, dad, mum, you know, the jack or whatever. All right, and two, can we at least discuss what you think you want me to be in the future? So these are very serious issues. In fact, I don't. In fact, I feel quite sad for the young today, and I'm really, really nervous about how my son Christopher is going to cope in a world in which confusion reigns. All right, there's so much confusion in our midst. There's no clarity. Okay. The few pages that I read, at least for Revelation, suggest to me that I think among the things that Luke is trying to achieve is trying to clarify certain things for us by way of telling us an exciting, dramatic story. All right, I will leave everything at that. Uh, I'm told that the books are on offer at such fantastic discounts that nobody should even think of leaving that door without picking up three copies. You know, all the three books, the sets, all right? Because it's like, it's better by the bundle, huh? Yeah. Right? But Luke will probably tell us more about this. Now it is my great pleasure to invite our guest of honor, Papa Singh, who's recently retired. How to speak after Prof Kirpa? Uh, he's such a speaker. Right? Uh, I'm nearly as good as him. <laughs> but not good enough. You're better. Right? I will, what he says actually strikes into everybody's heart. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story about religion. You know, when we were in the university, and during the time of exams, people go around converting people. And that's a fact of life. So I was reading this book, I was studying philosophy of religion. And then these two girls came and wanted to talk to me about religion. So I said, no, I'm going to... Then, then I looked up, one of them was quite beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I invited them. I needed a break. <laughs> right? I said, yeah, share with me. Right? Because religion by itself is good. It becomes evil when men interferes. So they shared for 10 minutes and I shared for one hour. <laughs> They went off, they came back to me again, and basically I told them, I said, you're 18 years old. People have told you this, you have not experienced life. I said, why don't you live life, and when you believe in it, and come across it, then say with passion. Today, you're just spewing words out. I said, the only reason I invited you is because you are very pretty. <laughs> and that was a fact. He said, there are so many books on Revelation, Apocalypse, Genesis, but everyone has a different treatment. It's how you treat the book and understand it with your own personal experience. That will make the book come alive. No author can dictate your mind. But your interpretation of the book will be your experience. And that's the greatness of books. Sadly, not many people read nowadays. Right? Albert Einstein, Prophecy of the World, killing each other and there's no more interaction is coming true. You go to a dinner and everybody is SMSing. I mean, come on, your friend is just across the table and you're SMSing him. <laughs> the whole idea of interaction is gone. But when you read and open the world up and then you talk about it. Right, uh, when I was in the university, I had this very great friend who 
he knows Tamil, brilliantly intelligent. Every time after a lecture, we will go to the pub and we will have a pint of beer and two and we will talk about the book. And then we will write about what we feel. And the lecturers will ask, where's your bibliography? I said, okay, uh, sorry, uh, Holland Village, this pub. <laughs> Fiction is another word for creativity. Right? We have to understand that. It's the creativity of the mind that creates so many types of fictions and many come through in later life. When I was a kid, I used to watch that cartoon called Jetsons. Mm -hmm. I am not sure whether you all know it. Right? The guy who created it, other guys made it happen. And that is the beauty of life. As sad it is, as cruel as it is, but we have something to make it better, but we don't understand it. Right? And uh, if only we can... You see, in my school, I was, a, I was a teacher, I was a principal. I started making, working in a, uh, making car batteries, earning $120 a month. I mean, those days, life was quite different. Interesting. Today, you all grow up because your parents have the money to give you. Your experiences are different. I would suggest experience life. Take a backpack, go and travel the world. I travel half the world on a backpack, living in $2 dormitories. And that's where I learned. Because the scope is so beautiful. And one day when I was in Turkey, I was sitting down drinking with the Turks in Istanbul. Just opposite us was the Blue Mosque. It was such a beautiful sight, and we were drinking this cheap wine. I think it cost me two dollars a bottle. It was called sharabi. Sharabi in our language means drunk. <laughs> and that's the purpose of drinking. Come on. <laughs> if you don't want to get drunk, don't drink. <laughs> like the Red Indians used to get drunk on a certain drug to feel their inner soul and to have different flights. But I was a young rookie there. While drinking with them, the more sounded a prayer call. And then they say, hey, we got to go to the mosque. And here I'm saying, hey, but you drink what cannot go. <laughs> you know how stupid I was? They said, we'll come back and explain to you. So they went there. And then they came back. So I said, you are supposed to explain something to me. He said, if you believe in God, if there is such a thing called God, right? because in our, if I want to prove the theory of God, whether it's omnipotent, omnibenevolent and omnipresent, then God doesn't exist. Because some things go wrong some way. It's faith. And they told me, do you only pray to God when you are in trouble? Who are you to decide when God wants to see you or when you want to see God? You see Him in any state you want. You don't decide. And you are an ordinary creature. Why do you make rules? That's why religion controls people. Marxism. Religion is the opium of the people. Religion is good if you know how to measure it with reason. But you have to have faith. And it's blind faith. Otherwise it doesn't work. But be very careful. Right? Because up to today, every war is fought and manipulated on religion. And the ordinary people die. That's dangerous. Fiction. The Mayan theory didn't come true, neither did the Apocalypse and the Four Horsemen. Right? I remember reading these books a long time ago. It was not written by Luke. Right? Written by many other authors. But let me talk about Luke a bit. 
I was uh, given the opportunity to start a school, so they gave me an empty piece of land. I designed and built a school, and Luke was one of it was my first batch of the students in West Spring. They never had a chance to enjoy the school because we were holding in one school and another school and another school. And by the time I built that school, they were so jealous because it looked like a country club, right? And I've always taught them learn to be a rebel. I was told, oh, you can't do this standard, oh, you can't do that standard, oh, you can't do this standard. And I was teaching my students, why not? Why not? Sir, can we do this? Why not? So what do you mean? Yeah, go and think about it. <coughs> why limits you? Why not? expands all your mind and even bring the recesses of your mind to the surface. So he was lucky to be under me. I never taught him. But my students learn, why not? He was a, he, he tried quarreling with the principal and he thought you won. Right? There's a story where he was rude to me and I just kept quiet and then the teacher told him later, I think you better apologize to the principal. He said, but I'm right. I think you should go and think about it. And then he came to apologize to me and I just looked at him and I just hugged him and said, you need to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know he was getting all these favors because his mom and I were together in IE and we grew up together. She used to love me, but... <laughs> <laughs> but there were so many girls who used to love me, so I said, no, nope, sorry. <laughs> right? So I shied away from women those days. Now I'm free, I'm, I'm single. Anybody? <laughs> right? And one day, just a couple of months ago, Luke, SMS me, I mean, uh, email me, and he told me, he said, Sir, I remember these words that you told me. He was a four normal academic student, moving on to five normal academic. He passed every year. He was lucky. 